basically what you're saying is this was a decision that you believe at least was made in order to break, obviously break Western Europe off from Russia. So they have to stay stuck basically in this war in Ukraine. Um, but if that's the case, I mean, doesn't that cons- doesn't that qualify as like some sort of it's like a terrorist attack. Like you're you're basically carrying out an act of violence, in this case, an act of uh sabotage against critical energy infrastructure to get your way politically <laughs> i mean well, just, that's right it's it's a, certainly the the people doing it were very dismayed I mean, he's i think he joe Biden has lost that part of the operations community there many of them are dismayed and you, the word you can use is act of war mm-hmm. hello everyone i'm rania kalik and this is dispatches After the Nord Stream pipeline that delivered gas from Russia to Germany was blown up in September, U.S. and European officials and their media stenographers pointed the finger at Putin, and it was invoked to justify further escalation against Russia in Ukraine, a conflict that has brought the world to the brink of World War III and potential nuclear Armageddon. But later in the year, Western officials quietly admitted that they had no evidence that Russia did it. And almost overnight, the Nord Stream explosion fell out of the headlines. That is, until award-winning investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch published a bombshell report at Substack titled How America Took Out the Nord Stream Pipeline. Citing a source with direct knowledge of the operational planning, Hirsch reported that the U.S., under Biden's orders, destroyed the Nord Stream Pipeline using remotely triggered explosives with the help of the CIA U.S. Navy divers, and NATO member Norway. This means that the U.S. targeted critical energy infrastructure of its most important European ally, a major violation of sovereignty, and what essentially constitutes an act of war. The White House and Norwegian officials denied the claims, while other Western government officials and media personalities have tried to dismiss the story as the rantings of a bad reporter. But Hirsch isn't so easy to dismiss. He won a Pulitzer Prize in 1970 for uncovering the massacre of Vietnamese civilians in My Lai. He went on to break one major story after another, from domestic CIA spying to the torture of Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib. He exposed the U.S. redirection in the Middle East to support Sunni extremists in its obsessive war on Iran and its Shia allies. And he shed light on internal disagreements inside the national security apparatus over how deeply to intervene in the U.S. regime change war on Syria. Joining me today to discuss his latest report is Seymour Hirsch. But before we jump into it, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can help it grow by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news or by donating below on YouTube. Seymour Hirsch, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, you know, for anybody, of course, everybody who's watching has probably read your piece. We'll link to it in the description. It's a huge bombshell. But let's start with why did the U.S. blow up Nord Stream and why is this such a dangerous development? Well, you're just going to get my opinion because, of course, the United States says it did not do that. <laughs> Good point. It denied it totally. No, I agree with you. It's 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 a little bit of a laugh, laugh riot. But it's taken seriously by some, you know, a lot of them, uh, to my surprise, it's taken, at least nobody's challenging, nobody does anything about it in the major media. They just don't, you know, they don't know what to do. Um, because I think after Trump, they were so happy to have, not necessarily a Democrat, but somebody reasonably rational. And little did we know that Biden was going to decide that he was going to, he was going to do what Jack Kennedy did. He was going to win a war in Kent, in Vietnam. He was going to win his against the Russians mm-hmm. and be reelected, and life would be great. I, I, don't, I have no idea what the motive was, but I always think presidents, um, they, they look at war as a, as a political blessing. I mean, that's been the history. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, anyway, um, so, but I can tell you what he did. I can't tell you. I mean, I know what he did. I can tell you what I, what I, uh, my guess is he did. But you know, since look, their position is they haven't, they didn't do it, so nobody's talking uh, about. But uh, but one of the things I looked at was um, uh, let me start at the beginning. Uh, okay. The story I wrote had its the story that 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 I know had a, had its beginnings about two two months before uh, the actual invasion, 
in late uh, 2021, the Russians were moving troops in and they were at an alarming number into Belarus. And um, and uh, Biden and Trump, and um, actually Putin is the guy I'm thinking about. And Putin was um, um, dead serious. He'd had it with us, um, all the rhetoric. There's a lot of anti-Putin rhetoric coming out of the Biden, uh, Biden and his uh, foreign advisors, uh, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, and um, what's what's her name? I can't even remember Victoria her name. Victoria Newland. <laughs> Victoria Newland, who we all know did what she did in in 2014 mm -hmm. to overthrow the help overthrow. The Americans were definitely involved in what they call the Maid uh, operation uh, in uh, overthrowing the pro Russian, um, pro Russian, I guess, uh, leader of uh, Ukraine and install their guy in, who later became ended up becoming Zelensky. Got in later in an election. Mm -hmm. So um, there's no question where they stand on all things Russia. Uh, actually, I call that gang. If you have if you have people who know children's books in in English, I call the Blinken and Sullivan and Newland. I call them Winken, Blinken, and Nod. There's a, a wonderful <laughs> thing to talk about it. They're just like they're like children. Yeah. They think they can go around and and uh, really destructive uh, children making trouble for China, making trouble for Russia. And it gets them support. What they don't understand, there's a huge segment of the of, of the world. More than half the population supports the Russian Chinese side uh, because America has seen, as it has been since World War II, um, uh, well, it's seen now by a lot of people in the world as, as basically um, a predator. I mean, we're, we, you know, yes, Putin did a terrible thing starting the first, the most bloody war we've had since uh, World War II in, in Western Europe, no question. We had a war in the Balkans, we had the uh, the, the Chechen War, but this is really bloody. You, you can't, you gotta fault him for that, no matter how much he was provoked, and he certainly was provoked. Um, but, you know, we're the country that responded to the uh, crazy Muslims, uh, Al-Qaeda, et cetera, coming out of Saudi Arabia. By We responded to that by attacking Iraq, Mm -hmm. whose leader, wacko, all equally crazy, um, Bashar Saddam, but he was also incredibly hostile to the same people that uh, that burnt, knocked down our house. And then they moved on to Bashar Assad, who is, of course, his father, and he both also hated radical Muslims. So it's just it's just sort of bewildering, uh, the, the zigbat, zigbat we've done, you know. But But so Biden comes in. And every president who gets in, as I said, wants a war. And this, you know, I guess it fit. He wants to be reelected. The party's ambivalent about it. The question I have is, why did he do what he did in late September? But I'll start at the beginning, because I'm sure you tell, you've told a little bit in the opening. Yeah. What, what I wrote Please. about was the fact that two months before Russia invaded, uh, Jake Sullivan, as the head of national uh, national security advisor, convened a meeting. Of, uh, of of the CIA, NSA, State Department, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Treasury Department, they supply money, uh, all that stuff in the in a, in a in a in a special room in the White House uh, across the street in the Executive Office Building, of what to do. And at that time, the issue was: uh, is there something that we some something up our sleeve that we could have something that would convince the Russians not to go? I'm not talking about a nuclear threat. And so they had a debate, and and I actually used some of the words that were sort of trying to warn warn people in the White House take this seriously. The I, the, the questions was the question as as put to them. I don't know whether by Sullivan or somebody from the government was do we want something that's a reversible or something that's irreversible? A reversible option would be sanctions and stuff like that. And you know you can ask uh, ask Fidel the late Fidel Castro. We've been we've been sanctioning Cuba since 1961. Mm -hmm. Now, do you want sanctions, which obviously didn't work then and hasn't worked against Russia particularly? Oh, I forgot to turn my phone down. Hold on. No worries. I have to live with. It. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll hide it. I meant to turn it off. Anyway, um, and so um, uh, when the option was, of course, let's do something irreversible, kinetic kinetic bomb something so they by january they came up with the idea yes maybe we can blow up the pipelines if that's what you want that was the, there was signaling going on that's that's the recommendation at least there was signaling i don't want to get into what i know about anything 
because um, uh, the way I, I structured it, there's no reason to think I know anything more than I wrote. Anyway, um, I'm talking about protecting sources, of which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, so eventually this idea, and they told the White House in no oh, mid-January, something like that, look, we, we, gotta, we can do something. Just want you to know it's possible, it's gonna be hard, but we've got an option. And sure enough, it, only in this White House, this this place, <laughs> this dim-witted White House, within a week or so of that, uh, Newland, in a while, in a, just she wasn't asked the question. She just blurted out, uh, "Oh, for some background. You, you you have to understand that Russia has a lot of gas and oil, mm -hmm. and uh, Russia has been supplying uh, gas to Western Europe since in pipelines. Well." The Kennedys back in the in the early '60s, the Kennedy administration was worried about Russia, because we were always anti-communist. We came out of World War II needing somebody to hate, so we had Stalin, and then we had uh, Khrushchev. Then we I don't I don't know about Gorby. It's hard to hate him, Gorbachev, but we certainly hate Putin. So we came out of there having somebody to hate, and uh, uh, the Kennedys always worried about um, uh, what they called the weaponization of Russian gas and oil to make Germany and Western Europe, Europe happy. They saw that as a weapon, a political weapon. And so they always worried about it. That was one of the things. On the other hand, we always told NATO, uh, we helped support, we helped build up Western Europe after World War II into little democratic models. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we ended up supporting Germany once uh, once they paid the dues for having murdered, raped, and, and destroyed much of Europe, which they did. Uh, Willy Brandt was particularly important in that, and they call it us politic, which the idea is he's told Western Europe, I'm going to make a lot of money and I'm going to trade with you. I'm going to make everybody rich and we're going to be great partners and you, you're going to let us into the club. It took a long time before they got into the club. Right. France hated, I mean, after the war, are you kidding? Uh, there was a lot of hatred. But the fact that Russia and, 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 and uh, Germany were close just in terms of trade, always bothered us. It bothered us in the Cheney Bush uh, uh, period after uh, after 9-11. Condi Rice, who was then the Secretary of State, I, I've seen tape after tape of her saying, we must stop the Russian gas and oil that can't, can't come. Cheney, uh, when, when Biden was vice president, he headed a panel, had the same idea. We've got to worry about this. So this is not a new idea. He did not think of something new. We always worried about the Russian control, particularly after the first pipeline, the Nord Stream 1 and 2. Nord Stream 1 was put up in the play in 2011, and it was a bonanza. It pumped gas like crazy from Russia at cheap prices into Germany. Uh, Germany industry ballooned. Uh, they had so much gas, they were selling it downstream, they called it, selling it to other pur purveyors, other companies. And Russia said, OK, we don't care, at a cheap price. Um, they have, we know about Mercedes and, and BMW, they have all these cars. They also have the largest chemical plant, fact, uh, chemical business uh, in, 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 in the world, BASF. BASF is huge. Yeah. And, and so uh, in two, when all the rhetoric was coming at, at Biden, all the anti, uh, when uh, Biden was from the beginning shooting at Russia, Russia uh, intervened in the election for which there was against Hillary to elect Trump, there was no evidence for that. There is no evidence for that. I'm telling you, none whatsoever, ever. It's just a fantasy of, uh, actually, of the, of the uh, Obama White House. That, that's sort And Hillary, obviously, pushing it, too. Hillary said as much after the election, she claimed not nearly as much as Trump, but she claimed pretty constantly that Trump, Trump stole her election. So it's ironically tech. It doesn't matter. You know, we're a country that doesn't believe in irony when it comes to us. <laughs> and so anyway... So what happened is they had this option. Uh, once, uh, uh, once they told the White House about it, um, uh, um, uh, the Clown Act began be, be, because um, uh, Biden, uh, ac actually um, the undersecretary, Victoria Newland, had said it in late, February, late uh, January, about the 20th of January. Mm -hmm. Apropos of nothing, she said at a, when she was talking to the press, and Nord Stream 2, the one that had been completed, but it had been sanctioned by the Germans at our request. In other words, it was sitting there 
750 miles coming from all the way across the bulk, all the way down to, I don't know which direction it is on a map, it looks down. <laughs> um, <laughs> coming from the from Russia, from um, uh, a Russian port near uh, St. Petersburg, all the way down to Germany. One loop, 750 miles. And when it was sanctioned, it was full of gas. They were ready to start shipping. And so they, they stopped it full of gas. That's why there was so much gas in the explosions. And um, once she she said we will be able to stop Nord Stream two by one way or another or one means or another, mm -hmm. and about two weeks after that, maybe twenty days later, Schultz, the uh, the the under fire chancellor right now he's pretty much under fire chancellor yeah. of Germany, uh, met with uh, Biden in the White House and he was asked two weeks before the invasion began in early February of last year, um, uh, he, Biden was asked about. Uh, Nord Stream 2 coming online. He said, it will not happen. And somebody said, I can guarantee you that. And somebody said, well, how are you going to stop it? He said, we know how to stop it. He said, I can tell you. So at that point, um, the guys in the mission, and these are pros. This is a very sensitive mission. They went to Norway right away. I don't know if you've followed all the stuff I've done in Substack, but after that piece, I've done a couple more pieces. One of them was all about Norway. Norway's been our back pocket for a long time. They were there in Vietnam very early provoking a war and they were there they've always been working with us on covert stuff i've seen a picture of the four, one of the uh, in early 1945 bill colby who later head at the uh, cia was in the office of strategic services he was jumping you know in the war we were jumping guys behind the enemy lines a photograph him with a bunch of norwegians somewhere on a mission mm -hmm. so they've always been with us it's not a one-time deal. We went to Norway because we know they're in our pocket. We also spend hundreds of millions, so probably a billion dollars upgrading their defense stuff. Norway goes from Oslo in Europe, basically, 1,400 miles straight up to the Arctic Circle where it meets Russia. And way up there, we've put, we've rebuilt a submarine base. We've made a, a, a Navy base much bigger and better. Uh, we've added a, a fantastic uh, a new radar a billion dollar radar, who knows what it costs, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, to monitor the Russians, there's a big Russian uh, uh, missile base on the other side of what, what is known as the Kola Peninsula. Boy, there's a lot of stuff up there. I never really looked at it. a lot of islands that are just, must be frozen all the time. I have no idea who owns them. Anyway, Finland's up there somewhere. <laughs> That's all I know. I don't think I want to go to Finland, it's too cold. But anyway, so, um, so just to finish my soliloquy. Um, uh, so what happens is, they trudge along. Uh, they're doing their mission. Their mission is to think of ways to deter Russia. Russia starts the war. Uh, they finally uh, find a way to put the problem with going underground and putting mines underwater in, into the Baltic Sea is there's no oil there. Mm -hmm. There's no oil rigs. And so a bunch of guys in, in, in you know, on a, even on a Norwegian ship suddenly jumping off and going down would be seen. Right. And the Russians, of course, uh, they actually have unmanned submarines that patrol. I mean, it's a whole new world of patrolling and uh, and, and spying on the other side uh, with uh, uh, devices that take no human beings. You know, what can I tell you? It's all been, it's a wonderful world. You can <laughs> right. spy on anybody. Anyway, so they found a way, there was an exercise for the last 21 years. They did it last year too. Uh, there were, uh, the, the Baltic Sea is part of the, our American NATO um, it's a NATO. It's controlled. The sea. The sea has. It's, it's. It's surrounded by NATO countries, and the American Sixth Fleet is the boss. The commander, the admiral of the Sixth Fleet, is the commander. And so a, a deal was worked out that in their next, uh, next uh, every summer they have every June, late May and June they have an exercise. They would add a uh, a mining exercise to it. Nobody cares about mining, dropping mines. It, it's not a dramatic business. Yeah. When you get out of the Navy Academy, the last thing you want to go is is to the mining command. You want to be a SEAL or you want to be a pilot or you want to, you know, be a sub run a nuclear submarine. You don't want to be a guy who heads up a unit that drops mines. <laughs> but they had an exercise going and in it they managed to plant the plant the bomb uh, on all plant bombs on all C4, very enough to each blow up a whole major building in New York. I mean, really powerful. You're dealing with a steel pipe. There's two of them on each side. There's, uh, there's there's steel pipes covered by concrete because you have to keep the water out because it, the pipes might get tarnished or destroyed by the salt in the water. Anyway, so um, uh, they get it done and the president backs off. 
He doesn't want to do it at, during the time of the exercise because that'll look too obvious. So three months later, three and a half months later, in late, no, uh, late September, the 26th, he says, go. And he blows up the pipelines. And the, I've looked hard at what was going on in, in, uh, in, the, F, in the war in the Ukraine then. Uh, as you know, Russia got off to a very slow start. I, 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 this may be just American propaganda I'm reading. I don't think that Putin, the, the intelligence people, the intelligence people I know, have always had a different story about the war than the, than the major newspapers in the New York Times and the Washington Post that I read here, which are much more pro-American. Um, they never thought Russia ever wanted to go to Kiev. Remember, they circled Kiev. They thought that Putin's, it was a great idea his generals gave him because there were 60,000 troops in Kiev. And as long as you had the troops there, the Russian troops around the city, they were locked in. You yeah. could keep them away. And I think he thought, I did think he, he would go to Donetsk and win, sweep through everything. There was opposition. It didn't work as well as he wanted. But by late late fall, so, um, it was pretty clear. Uh, so I, I forget, I've done a lot, in the last couple of weeks, I've talked to a lot of people about this period because that's when the president decided to do it on September 26th. By late fall, it was at best a stalemate. It wasn't being reported that way. But everybody knew there's just no way you're going to beat Russia. He hasn't yeah. committed his main army yet. And this is an army. These are the guys. I mean, these are tough. These are the guys that in the last couple of days, a week, more, more than a few days, a week before the fall of Stalingrad to the Germans in that terrible winter, Russia was losing every four hours, 2,400 people dead and wounded. And they kept on going. And they won the war. No way, Ukraine's. And you see it now. It's beginning... Everybody's beginning to understand it's it's over. Yeah. And it's just a question of how much can Zelensky steal enough money to make him happy to get out is the issue right <laughs> now. I don't know what's going on. That's my attitude. So at that point, the problem Biden had is that there was a lot of opposition. There's much more now that's more open. There was a lot of resentment about all the money he was putting and all the money he was asking of Europe for the war in Ukraine because the other intelligence services in Europe and NATO could see the same lack of a, of a victory. He wasn't going to get a victory there, and he was going to be stuck in some horrible mess that who knows how he's going to get out of it. He's not a rocket scientist by, by president, and the people around him are terrible hawks. I mean, they've, they're doing the same thing to China that they did to to Russia. I mean, just insulting him. My, my sec Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, pointed his finger at his Chinese counterpart in public. And I can tell you from people that take, I know people that in the State Department that take you know, a, American senior people don't know China to China for diplomatic meetings. And they say, no such stuff. Don't ever point at them like that. And I, I, and anyway, um, it's appalling to me that we yeah. have such terrible political leadership and that the Democrats are so frightened of another Trump coming that they, they won't touch Biden. The Senate has, the Democrats run the Senate. They haven't said a word about it. Chuck Schumer, the chairman. And when I was doing stuff on Vietnam for the New York Times, the Democrats in the Senate were against the war, by including many moderate Republicans, uh, but no more. Anyway, the bottom line is, here's the thought, here's what you want to know. The th my thinking, it's, not, it's the thinking of other people I know who will never go public, mm -hmm. is that he decided that he may lose the Germans on this one because another winter is coming and, uh, and they didn't want to give the money he wants the, the public there is openly now, there were marches last weekend in, in Berlin, big marches, and in other cities against the war. He knew the war was increasingly unpopular. He also knew that Schultz was under pressure on that issue. And so, he, you know, and so Schultz obviously had an option. If, if, the, if it was a cold winter, he could always uh, unmask the sanctions and start uh, making his people warm, the mm -hmm. businesses happy, and everybody making money again, you know, having all the money they wanted. He'd stockpiled enough gas so they could, they could get through most of the winter. I mean, it's okay, they're okay, but they're suffering. I mean, uh, uh, the biggest chemical company has cut back people, cut back production, talking to the Chinese about moving some facilities there because they can't be sure of enough gas. The pipeline's gone. They can't open it. And... Uh, uh, the, the Germans subsidized, uh, have a lot of money. They're very frugal and they, they're subsidizing an awful lot of the heating costs. So the people, and it's been a warm winter so far and it's got cold in the last week or two, last month in Berlin, particularly. 
But in Spain, oh, in, in France, people are paying as much as five times for electricity because the 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 uh, gas is used to charge the turbines. Uh, it's three or four times in Italy. Europe is getting feeling the pinch. Mm -hmm. uh, in Berlin, a, a large baker who bakes bread stuff all over the for all, to be shipped across the country had 12 ovens, 12 ovens going. He cut back to three or four because he yeah. doesn't have enough gas. And the gas he has the, does have cost them more. And um, uh, so we're seeing it then enough to make people say, so what Joe Biden did, he said, okay, you America, you've had, Western, Western Europe has nothing, no oil or gas. They have people, they have uh, big businesses, but no, in, no, no underground facilities like in, in Russia. Russia's just loaded with all this, all these chemicals and all these oils and all that stuff. And so um, he's told them, uh, basically he said, well, America doesn't have your back anymore. We'd rather pour more money into this sleuzy war in 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 Iraq and Ukraine, one one that everybody but him and his his gaggle of uh, wink and blink and a nod. Um, uh, we'd rather do that than than help you help you stay warm and comfortable. And that's what's going on. And in the long run, I, look, I, um, uh, I don't talk to politicians in Europe. I just and I don't talk. I really don't. I never did when I, I never testified before Congress. I don't like to talk to politicians. But I'm getting more calls from the Bundestag, the German parliament that I am from, where people are saying, you know, wanting to know what you want to know, what I know. Hmm. And so um, uh, he's he's shown that America in a pinch, this this government anyway, is not going to be faithful. And so yeah. it's it's led to new thinking on NATO. It's led to new thinking in Germany. It's led to new thinking in, in, in the rest of Western Europe. All right, you can talk now. <laughs> well, so no, I mean, I mean, so basically what you're saying is this was a decision that you believe at least was made in order to break, obviously break Western Europe off from Russia. So they have to stay stuck basically in this war in Ukraine. Um, but if that's the case, I mean, doesn't that const doesn't that qualify as like some sort of it's like a terrorist attack? Like you're you're basically carrying out an act of violence, in this case, an act of uh sabotage against critical energy infrastructure to get your way politically <laughs> i mean well, said, that's right it's it's a, certainly the the people doing it were very dismayed i'm mean, he's i think he joe Biden has lost that part of the operations community there many of them are dismayed you, the word you can use is act of war mm -hmm. i did a lot of work ironic not ironically i did a lot of work on the legal implications of blowing up a, a gas pipeline because this is a new phenomenon. There's a phenomenon. It's about twelve thousand miles of gas pipeline right now, and it's and the number of pipelines are growing enormously. It's a big industry, and the, we have signed the United States has signed international agreements going back to 1884 on telegraph wires that are underground. If you inadvertently cut one, you're you're liable. And so there's also there's no at this point there's no law because nobody's ever done what he did before blow up a pipeline. There's no law, at least not overtly maybe it's been done covertly by you know uh in in uh, in wartime and all that but uh but the first case that comes up it'll produce law because any, any judge will rule is a criminal activity and so he's also got a problem if he admits it that he's going to have you know there's in one year one of the years that uh, uh with Nord Stream one uh which 51 percent is owned by Gazprom, which are uh, you know the oligarchs that are certainly in the thrall of putin in one year, that 51% generated $45 billion in income to the Russian treasury. One year. So, and you know, and so imagine how much was made elsewhere. If that much they, the oligarchs distributed to him. Yeah. Um, and so he's lost that. And uh there's and there's stockholders. It's, it was a, the Nord Stream was a stockholder company, 49% of the of the pipeline was financed and owned by four European countries. And they, so America, if he acknowledges he did it, there could be incredible legal suits filed by the yeah. stockholders. And also, like, as you're talking about a act of war against your own allies, which is a pretty significant 
thing to do. Nobody wants to talk about that. Right. You know, my, my old newspaper where I worked, I worked for seven, eight years there doing all kinds of stories. One, as you know, you, you'll tell the people maybe, uh, oh, well, when I get off all this, all the stuff I've done on the CIA, never with a name source. And all of a sudden, the fact that I'm not naming a source is a really <laughs> yeah. big deal. You know, speaking to that, actually, I did want to ask you um, to respond to or to, to give you an opportunity to respond, because I'm sure you saw uh, Ned Price calling your report. He called it utter and complete nonsense that should be rejected out of hand. It would not be typical for us to engage allies and partners on something that is utter and complete nonsense and that should be rejected out of hand uh, by anyone who is looking at it through uh, <clears throat> through an objective lens. Yes, go one, ahead. One, one more aspect on this. One of the allegations that Hirsch makes is that it was taken off the CIA in order to prevent involvement uh, oversight uh, as a covert operation. Did you read the piece? I'm familiar with it. Uh, one of his allegations is that it was taken off the field. Look, we're, we're, rather than let this this propaganda get, be, be aired in, in the briefing room. Right. And then Democratic Senator Chris Murphy attacked your article in a tweet uh, by referring to you in this very condescending way as a formerly reputable author. So what's your response to these sorts of attacks? Oh, um... Uh, look, in 1969, I wrote a story as a freelance writer about the massacre at My Lai, that our boys killed 500 people. And at the time, I I had worked for the Associated Press. I was a freelancer. I was a young kid. And I, I, uh, I found the story. It took me a long time to track it down. I tracked it down. I had a charge sheet against this man, William Kelly, who turned out to be one of about 50 officers involved. But that's another story. The way they are, I actually done more work on it. I, during COVID, I spent uh, three years, almost two and a half years doing uh, more work on that aspect because I didn't want to write about Trump. Writing about Trump for me uh, was like, um, he's like low hanging fruit. Yeah. By that I mean, it didn't matter whether you're right or wrong because everybody hated him. So you could write whatever you want. So the newspapers all got into There's this. There's no courage. It takes. It took no courage to no, write about no, Trump. No, no, not only that, yeah. if you were wrong, so what? You still said something nasty about him. And what you wrote was, if you worked for the New York Times, you wrote something nasty, you were sure to get on MSNBC and uh, CNN that night to talk about it. And eventually they started paying you money. Mm -hmm. So what I saw it as the, you know, when I was a kid, when I was at the Times in the 70s and Watergate and Vietnam, I would write a story and the Times had a public relations office. This is the New York Times way back then. When it had almost 2 million sub papers, daily subscribers, they have 310,000 or 20,000 now. They don't care about it. it's all it's all online stuff. That's where they make their money. Not not in the, the paper's a loser. You know who cares about a print paper? <laughs> but they used to call me sometimes and say NBC wanted to go on and talk about it. I would say to the lady who ran publicity for the New York Times, "What are you talking about? It'll be in the paper. They can read it in the paper. I don't have to go talk about it." <laughs> the idea of doing it was so anathema to me. It's such a now you just go on and you bring your mascara to work. You know, men or women. You know what can I tell you? And so anyway, <laughs> but it does make a difference. And so what happens is, um, on that case, um, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you about the, it's all about hating Putin more than anything else. And the Democrats are, are worse than any, they're, at least some of the Republicans, some of the, even the loony ones are, don't want to support the, Iran, the, uh, the war in Ukraine. Yeah. And he's put tens of billions, it could even be closer to 100 billion, nobody knows the real number. He's put yeah. incredible money in there. That's a lot of money. And he wants Europe to keep on giving him more money and they don't want to anymore. They smell the rot. And so that's all part of it. So the question is, what does he do now, my president, with his gaggle of morons? What does he do? <laughs> well, speaking of a gaggle of morons, not just, of course, the people surrounding him, but also it's really, I mean, it's it's amazing to see the silence from all these major media outlets, all these major mainstream <laughs> Western media outlets. I mean, this is obviously a bombshell report. You know, and of course, people are trying to dismiss you, but you're not so easily dismissible given your very lengthy history of, you know, investigative reporting and bombshell reports, which the whole world does seem to recognize except for the U.S. media. So why do you think that is? Why do you think people in the mainstream media in the U.S. would rather believe that you're lying than that the U.S. could have done this? I... I I don't know. <laughs> Probably also I mean, hating Putin. Who knows? <laughs> I worked at the New York Times for seven or eight years in a tough time. And when somebody else had a good story, we chased it. We didn't worry about, you know, and you particularly, I mean, it's not as if, you know, I was saying when 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 I uh, 
And when I did the story about Milai, just to say this is this is nothing compared to when I had I had this massacre. I learned about a massacre. I found a charge sheet that the army all was hidden. I found the guy Kelly. I went and I went on a military base and found him. I'd been in the army. I knew a little bit about how they keep books. You know, they 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 you know one you 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 have to get housing for an officer when he returns from Vietnam, and you don't know then that he's a war criminal and he's going to be prosecuted. So I could find, I found him eventually, talked to him. <laughs> I'd been asked at that time by, I was a freelancer. I'd written a lot for the New York Times Magazine and other magazines about stuff. I'd written two books, and or a book anyway, and was writing a second. And uh, um, uh, uh, the, the magazine that wanted me to write Life and Look, when I went to them with this, they both didn't want to do it. Nobody wanted to be the first to write about it. So that was a bad time. Yeah, that was a bad time for me. I thought I, I might as well go and s be selling life insurance. What the hell am I doing in this business? <laughs> this is nothing compared to that. I got it. And I went to an underwater underground. Uh, I went to an underground newspaper and we got it out, and yeah. it became a big story, and I won all these prizes. So you can't ask me. You know, I I, uh, I ended up in the New York Times Bureau in 1972, and my experience. You know, I hadn't gone to. I was an editor of the Yale Daily News or the Harvard Crimson. Um, uh, my father got, uh, my parents are immigrants. First language was not English. No high school. I doubt if they got through high school. Um, my father had a store, uh, a little store in, in the black community in Chicago, which got me very close to the black community in the sense that the guys who worked there and worked there, he had a business, a little cleaning and laundry store. And I got to know the people working there as a kid. And uh, I got to understand that, that, because I was white and um, I was going to go to school and I was no matter what, even though we had no money, my father died of cancer when I was 16 or just turning 17. Um, even though we had no money, I was always going to do better than they could because of my color. And I knew that when I was 15 and I feel that same way, you know, we, the racist war we did in Vietnam, the way we describe it now is 58,000 American boys were killed in two or three, between two and 3 million Vietnamese. We can't even do a county. I mean, it's still, and same for what we did in Iraq and other places. There's a lot of racism involved in this too. And a lot of sense of American imperialism, you know, American, you know, that only we have the answers. And it doesn't matter that we would, we had a disaster in Iraq and a disaster in Afghanistan and everything we tried to do, we failed at in terms of that. It yeah. just doesn't matter. Uh, so we, we're, not, we're slow to learn, uh, you know, American hegemony. It's just a very, so I'm one of those, when I was at the New York Times, I used to argue with the editors because I was a star there. And, you know, let me just say this about America. Despite my humble beginnings, once I did the Me Life story, once it got accepted by the community, um, um, I was, uh, and I was, I was sticking two fingers at, you know, in, in, in the eye of a newly elected Nixon, a Republican president who campaigned on a slogan of he had a plan to end the war which turned out his plan to end the war was, guess what, to win it. You know, he started to secretly bomb things. I'll tell you, it's just crazy. But nobody went after me. Nobody said I had to go to a gulag. I won all the prizes, the fullest surprise, all these other prizes. I, we got enough money so that uh, I was newly married with a kid. We could buy, put a down payment on a house. At that time, you know, um, uh, a gasoline, you could get $4 a gasoline for a dollar. Yes, in 19, <laughs> 1960, what's it, in 69. Nice. And you could, um, heat for a home was 18, 18, 18 cents a gallon. Unthinkable. So you could you could live on, you know, my wife was a social worker and I was a, a freelance reporter. You could live on what little you had. Not uh, today. Not today with those jobs. No, I feel sorry <laughs> for the kids. All these, the, not yeah. the second generation, the third generation is even worse. Mm -hmm. These kids growing up, you know, well, you know how tough it yeah, is. Yeah, school, college debt. Um, oh well, I, I do want to ask you, speaking of imperial, imperial hu hu hubris, excuse me, I do want to ask you, and this is like another opinion question, but, you know, you were mentioning earlier, you mentioned Victoria Newland back in January of last year, basically threatening the pipeline. If Russia invades Ukraine, one way or another, Nord Stream 2 will not move forward. Um, and then the, you, there was, you know, you mentioned a few weeks after that, you had Biden again, kind of threatening the pipeline. If Germany, if uh, if Russia invades, uh, that means 
tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again, then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. Uh, and then you have the Russian invasion, um, and they had already started planning even before that, like you said. But then after the attack, uh, all these media outlets are really trying to point the finger at Putin. So were American politicians. But then you had something interesting. You have these these huge denials, like especially now after your report comes out, you have these denials. But at the same time, you have this parallel gloating like you had Anthony Blinken calling it a tremendous opportunity. There was that famous sort of moment on video. Ultimately, um, this is also a tremendous opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity to once and for all remove the dependence on Russian energy and thus to take away from uh, Vladimir Putin the weaponization of energy as a means of advancing uh, his uh, imperial designs. Uh, that's very significant, and, and that offers tremendous um, strategic opportunity for um, for the years to come. You had Victoria Nuland bragging that she was happy to see Nord Stream as a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea. Senator Cruz, uh, like you, I am, and I think the administration is very gratified to know that Nord Stream 2 is now, as you like to say, a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea. I mean, it's really incredible. Like, why do you think they're both denying it and then gloating about it? Am I maybe reading too much into that as some sort of smart strategy? <laughs> or what They're are your dumb. thoughts? They're dumb. They're dumb. That simple. Okay. Their ideology, they may have reasonable IQs, but their ideology has made them dumb. Okay. They're just dumb. It's just dumb to do what they did. It's dumb to make fun of the Chinese. It's dumb to go and, and cancel a summit meeting with the China, with the, with the, the, the Secretary of State of America cancels a summit meeting because of a balloon. That's what he did because of a balloon. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, I don't think it's been in the press, but I do know this. The pilot that shot down the balloon was on a new airplane that we, we probably paid $300 zillion for. And um, uh, this was the first time it ever shot anything down. It's an F-22. <laughs> no, it's it a, but, it, but it's a new plane. It was just out. You know, there's not that many. And they haven't put it in war yet. But so his first, his first hit was a balloon. The, oh missile. the missile That's probably cost 10 times more than the balloon did. Anyway, these missiles cost three, four. And so when he landed, I was a kid, you know, I was, when World War II ended, I was seven, eight years old and I, I followed it. And we had, in the war against the, uh, the Japanese, uh, we, we flew a zero, we flew P-51s against their zeros. And I, I followed this. I used to build model planes. And when you shot down a zero, the American pilots would put the, the uh, a little decal of them of the Japanese map on the side of their cockpit, and some of the guys who shot down twenty planes had a lot of them, you know, they're aces. And in Europe, uh, the same thing. Uh, the, the German Messerschmitt was the plane that uh, we'd like to shoot down. They were, they were, I don't know, P fifty ones were there. They weren't. There were different planes. Uh, uh, Navy had a lot of planes fighting, but there was a lot of American bombing, and and so we had little the 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 German swastika. So this pilot, when he shot down the balloon, he put on the side of his plane, he landed it, it came from a base somewhere in southeastern America, Georgia. I remember, but I, I was told, but he put a balloon on the side of it. Like Seriously? it was, a, but it was, he was making a joke, you know what I mean? Okay. Just I, I, ironic. He got a balloon, you know? That's, <laughs> oh my that's, God. That's, <laughs> oh man, that's like a so cell phone. Ridiculous. No, it's just, <laughs> it's just where we are right now. <laughs> we got, oh, it says so much. president that's old. He wants to be re, uh, he, he wants to be reelected. Uh, his wife wants him to be reelected, which is more important. I worked in polit presidential politics once, and I learned about what they call pillow talk. Mm -hmm. Man, don't cross the wife. It's just brutal. <laughs> well, you know, you wrote obviously you remember because you wrote it, but the piece that you wrote on Syria back in uh, 2014, I think it was, that caused so much controversy, was all about these like fractures inside the national security. A uh, community about how to how deep to get into the regime change plot uh, in Syria, uh, because obviously some people were more hesitant because they understood there was extremist elements inside the Syrian opposition. The point is, is that there was this somewhat of an internal debate taking place. And then when it comes to Ukraine, the stakes are so much higher than Syria because the stakes are obviously World War Three and potential nuclear war. Right. So my question Absolutely. for you is my question for you is. 
do you have a sense of how much of an internal debate there is inside the government right now about how deep to go with Ukraine? Is there any pushback like perhaps there was with Syria, any hesitancy to continue pushing forward? I, I, I think from some elements of all places, the intelligence community there is. Mm -hmm. I don't th I think the, the military is, I mean, it's, I mean, we're, we're not, ha we don't happen to be, be blessed by brilliant people running the Joint Chiefs of Staff these days. Mm -hmm. The last two guys have been, you know, um, pretty mediocre. I mean, but they follow, they, 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 they hew the line, they follow the line. We don't have any real opposition. There's elements, there are elements, there's actually, you know, so I'm told there was, there's a group that's been assigned to plan the peace treaty we have to write after Russia after Russia loses the war <laughs> for Ukraine. Their peace treaty. They're actually doing that. They're drafting that document. And so it's, you know, it's. <laughs> I don't, no, I don't think there's any. I don't think anybody's. Uh, look, the, the U.S. Congress is a, supposed to be, a, you know, a, a, in 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 the papers that were done. You know the brilliant papers that were done in by the colonials, the you know the the constitutional papers the, <laughs> by the Jefferson and Madison. They had arguments about the power of the state. Yeah, it was always designed that the Congress would be a counterbalance to the executive, and the courts would be a counterbalance to those two. And it's gone now. I mean, the courts have gone crazy. They're they're pretty extremists. I don't know. If, I don't know what's going to happen with the court on social issues here. They don't have much to do with the war. Yeah, you know they supported the illegal detaining of um of uh they supported guantanamo so did obama that's why i always i always faulted him two days in office he said i'm going to stop guantanamo the idea <laughs> that my country would hold that many people without any due process given our history given our history with colonialism and it just it's just was stunning to me it's a horrible horrible thing we did mm -hmm. uh to arrest people and i i do know that there were times in that early days of the war in the afghan if some guy, you know, um, whatever game they played, lost two cows to his neighbor, he would return him into our CIA as as a possible uh, uh, Al Qaeda, and yep. we would put him in a bag, put him, wrap him up, and send him there. And some of those guys have been with no justice, no awful. Uh, it's to me, I'm so ashamed of that. I was ashamed of that in real time. I'm so ashamed of what we did. So we've lost our way a long way, and Biden's not restoring it. And um, Trump certainly didn't restore it. Uh, Obama, I thought, would, but he failed. Mm -hmm. I gave him some due. Uh, uh, Obama jumped in on Syria, too. You know, Bashar Assad was one of the people that wanted to help us very much after 9-11. Right. And I wrote stories about the fact that he helped us with intelligence about al-Qaeda because he had no use for those terrorists like his father did. Yeah. And, well, he feared and, them. Uh, he actually also like feared them as a security threat. As well, oh my God! He right? blew up his old man. His old man blew up a whole town, but you yeah. know, blew up a whole, you know, uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, and for which there wasn't much love for him. I'll tell you that that was pretty mm -hmm. over the top, uh, and so um, uh, and and the same. S S Saddam was awful. Oh. We had an awful lot of people in our world that we didn't destroy. He's also our friend. Saddam was our friend. Well, but the thing him. about it was that he didn't. He the army had more Shia in it than Sunnis in, in the officer corps. He, we had an, the first election we had that we ran. We did it by percentage of Sunni, Shia, and other parties. So we we began the whole notion of de designating people by their their. It was the Lebanon. Their, it was the Lebanon model, basically. Like Iraq got the Lebanon model of sect based. Right, which, which it yeah. really yeah. works well, doesn't it, for making everything wonderful? So wonderful, I can tell you. you know, somebody who lives in Lebanon. <laughs> after nine eleven, I don't think I'd been in Lebanon until after nine eleven. Although I I had a lawyer then. Uh, my I had a lawyer. I went to law school with this guy. I I hated law school. I was out of there so fast it wasn't funny. But he was <laughs> the best student, and he his French and German were wonderful, and he did arbitration in Lebanon in the oh. in nineteen sixties and seventies, and that was the place you went to because it was such a, you know, as I said, the the other Paris. Everybody enjoyed going there. The women were fun, and the parties were fun. They and, still are. Um, <laughs> The parties are still yeah, this, that street's still going in Beirut. That the, yeah. the party street. The, the party in Beirut never stops. It's like actually kind of a, 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 it's like a weird bubble. It just stays how it is. But yeah, you know, <laughs> and so is the new restaurants cop up every other day. Yep. And uh, uh, the food is wonderful, you know, and the people are overly generous. I played a lot of tennis there too. They love sports, <laughs> and they love they love French football. Mm -hmm. And and uh, mostly and Argentinian, they all have every kid has a placard up. 
<laughs> it's a very interesting country. It's a great country to be at. I mean, it's 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 a uh, it's a fun well. It's, it's but you mentioned you know you mentioned Syria, and I want to just you know specifically. I think it's interesting. I don't know if you've been if you've been following like recent news there, but all these high level government officials from across the region just visited Damascus, and they're pushing to get Syria back into the Arab League. And this is kind of like I think the nail in the coffin of the U.S. attempt to isolate Syria from the rest of the region. And I'm just wondering if it kind of demonstrates some sort of level of like American policy failure um, and, because they tried really hard. You know this better than anyone because you wrote about it and you were quite ostracized for writing about the U.S. plan in Syria. But I'm just curious your thoughts since we're talking about the Middle East uh, oh. on the fact that the situation in Syria has not gone as the U.S. wanted. Bashar told me once in 2003 or four, you know, he was helping us. I went there because I learned from people in the community, actually in the CIA, that he had helped us enormously uh, after the war. You know, he, he, he unlike his father, the first couple of were with us. He did not. But that didn't mean he wasn't helping us. And that didn't mean that he wanted, he, and he, he told me once that one of the problems he had, you know, his his wife, who I never met, um, I, I um, uh, I just went to visit him. I, I was not as I was not a friend. I just went to visit him. I spent a lot of time with Nasrola too, who's really very bright. And why wouldn't you want to go talk to somebody that of interesting? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's amazing, and he is quite amazing. And you know, he lost a child in that, but he got he got he got he looked beyond that. And Bashar um, uh, uh, proved to be much tougher. And what people don't know about Bashar and standing up his army was that he wasn't supposed to replace his father when his father died he had an older brother that got killed in an automobile accident or something and so he was pulled in he was a doc he was um, um an eye doctor an eye doctor right? right yeah yeah i mean md and he was pulled in to run it and what he did is he had a he had joined a military class of a, a, something like 180 officers i think it was eight or nine months of constant on the marsh, running, beating up. And he finished about 35th or 36th, something like that, in the top third or the top 25% of the class. He had no choice because of his, you know, he had to work like a... And so he did that. So he learned the respect of the military. And people didn't know. We Westerners didn't understand it. We had an embassy then when I was going there. And they had a great... Walid was a great foreign minister. I loved him a lot, the big chubby guy. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and Bashar told me that in 2003, he, he understood the country was ridden with small level corruption. Anytime you wanted to do the business about anything with the government, it was all done on little pieces of paper. And it was always, there was always a bribe involved. And he wanted to get away with that. And so he asked, uh, he invited McKinsey, which is a large corporation, um, to come and do a study and make, give him an estimate of what it would cost to modernize with computers his society and he stopped the stop the nickel dime graph that was the, the taking so much money away from the pet from the, the lower middle class people you know if you wanted to get anything done you had to have a, a little grift right. involved yeah and so they they i don't know whether they actually did a study but at some point the state department said no they refused the, the company to do it i mean i what some guy's trying to move his country out of the the, you know, the paper business I, I, I could never figure out my country, and and I will tell you, um, uh, uh, and the idea that he had a nuclear reactor going is well, that was two thousand and seven. The Israelis bombed what they said was a nuclear reactor. It's hard to tell a reporter this because they don't think that way. It's now been fifteen years. Has there been another word about a nuclear program? And there's been a lot of talk about his chemical program, what he allegedly did. Not another word about a nuclear program. So the only thing he had for a nuclear program was a nuclear reactor. He didn't have <laughs> an office. One he didn't thing, have scientists. Yeah. He had just a reactor. That's that a he was. Point. Where did he get the ore for? He did, where, where, you know, that's you. You have to have a whole big bureaucracy to handle nuclear materials, even ore, even because it's radioactive. If it lets it anyway. I just, <laughs> I just, nobody looks back at that stuff i wanted to just briefly i don't i'm not sure uh what your take on this is but i know that sweden was apparently refusing to release information about its investigation into the explosion i'm just curious your thoughts on the potential role of sweden and denmark um uh, or where the the no the norwegians found a shallow area for us in the baltic gulf mm -hmm. you know and by the way 
it was near an island called Bornham, which was controlled by the, the Nazis. And there was oh, terrible right. fighting and the, the sea of the, of the, of the, there's uh, submarines and airplanes. There was a lot of war going on there. The sea is littered. The Baltic Sea is littered. So um, they had to find a place and they did find a place off an island called Bornham, which is um, uh, right off uh, Denmark. And at, at various times, the pipelines encroached into the uh, territorial waters of both Sweden and, and, and uh, Norway and um, Denmark. And so actually Bornham's part of a, a Danish island. And the Danes were original signers of the uh, of the uh, NATO agreement, along with uh, Norway. They were both the only 19 signed the first the first time in 1949, and very hawkish, mm -hmm. uh, anti-Russian, very close to the British until they worked together. Uh, and they're, they're competent intelligence services. They both do much more than they tell anybody they do for the West. You know, signal stuff and all this secret stuff. And um, uh, uh, let me narrow the question for me. I could well, I'm just, no, I'm just curious about, like, do you, do you think, think, they're, they're, what do you think the role? What do you think Denmark, Sweden, what do you think they know about it? My, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I'm this. asking you. I don't know. It just seems, it well, seems I'll just unlikely say, I'll just say that they four days after the Four <laughs> days after the, the explosion, there was a White House meeting and Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, who seems to be taken seriously by the press corps for reasons I cannot fathom. <laughs> and I just can't believe it. But he's given the press corps and the, the, it's four days after the explosion. It's about a, oh, about a, there's a, the, the White House tapes all these things. And you, yeah, it's about an hour thing, but 12 minutes go by before somebody asks about, about the pipeline. And of course, nobody, none of the people covering the White House either know or care or don't know that the, what Biden had said and Newland had said earlier, because nobody has ever asked that question. Mm -hmm. They don't ask that question. Well, Never. he said he was going to do it. Maybe it, it's happened now. It happened in one state. The one that would Ned Price you mentioned attacking me personally was that you who said that? I could talk. yeah yeah I mentioned that. Was, that, yeah. that was because somebody asked him about that briefing. Sam that, Hussaini, you can't yeah. do that. You can't say that the president said he was going to do it. Mm -hmm. That makes you a bad guy. Uh, anyway, so he was asked about the pipeline and was it? Did he think it was Russia? And he very seriously said, "Well, you know, Russia the way it's behaving makes it seem you know that's the way they're behaving." He said, "This guy who who ran the operation from the White House <laughs> point of view." So finally, incredible. Finally, he says, but I, we are doing, the Denmark and Sweden are going to do a study of it. And let's see what happens. They're going to do a study. Note, the United States is not going to do a study of it because he's, the president is not going to task, that's the formal word you use, the uh, the intelligence community because he he knows what the answer is. So right. he's not, he never asked, but they're going to do a study. So a month later, Sweden and Norway, Sweden and, and Denmark come up with a study. Uh, I think it was like, the incident took place the 26th. I think their study was the 16th. So three weeks later, come up with a study. And here's what they concluded, that indeed there was an explosion underground that triggered the gas. And it, it had every all the makings of some sabotage. That was their finding. Yeah. And after that, I said, okay, if these guys aren't, aren't to take, this proves it. Well, I mean, how could they? Look, I'll let them worry about it. Yeah. I'm having a drink tonight with somebody from one of those countries, by the way. Oh, so we'll maybe see. We'll, we'll see something by you soon, maybe about some more. Well, I'm doing something. I do one. I've done a couple of pieces since on Substack. I'm doing another one tomorrow. That'll be fun. Okay. I did pieces just pointing out that Norwegians have helped us a lot. And what right. else? I've just, you know, it's a great, uh, I got to tell you, I'm my own publisher. I still use the same editors and, that I did for the London Review and the, and the same people that were oh. fact checkers for the New Yorker. Yeah. Well, you have to, same standards. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, and I have a good editor, a really smart guy. And, he, you know, we he, I, I, we piss each other off a lot. Anyway, <laughs> the point is that um, uh, I don't have to have a system. I don't have to have a publisher and an editor. I'm my own publisher. And the response, I will tell you, they had a million hits in 20 hours on that story. That's because, incredible. And the, the mail I get, people know they're not getting the truth. Yeah. yeah. And I had a friend. I love to say this. I had a friend in the oil business, a very interesting, bright friend. And I think I mentioned after I, the story came out, he, he sent me a call. No, he sent me an email and he said, uh, my dear friend Seymour, he said, uh, you have become the master of deconstructing the obvious. That's a good, that's a good way to be that's described. All, that's all I did. I asked the question a month later. I said, Come on, who did it to somebody? And he said, well, I did it. And that's how going. It took me months to do the story, though. All well, right, goodbye, goodbye. Seymour Hirsch, thank you so much for joining me.
Thanks for watching everyone. If you want to see more progressive anti-imperialist content like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with the latest breakthrough news content. And if you want to support our work and get access to exclusive content, head over to patreon.com slash breakthrough news. Thank you.